guys. Thank you so much for coming here today and for being willing to listen to a lecture. And some of you I've already seen, and so thank you for coming again. And I'll try not to repeat myself too much. So let me see by a show of hands, who wants to be an entrepreneur? Okay, and the rest of you guys are just here for credit, is that right? <laughs> okay, so of the people who want to be an entrepreneur, raise your hands again. Okay, um, what kind of entrepreneur? Um, I, I haven't really decided yet. I, uh, I trust that my creativity will bring me to it. I love it, you're open, wide open. Okay, what, who else? What kind of entrepreneur, yes? Serial entrepreneur, I want to build and give it to somebody else to buy it or manage it. Okay, great. I know I have a few friends who do that and do it very well. Um, okay, who else? Who wants? Who else wants to talk? Who else wants to be an entrepreneur? Yes. I want to be a good one. A good one. I love that comment. That's a great comment. Okay, because that's what I'm talking about today is how to be a good entrepreneur and things that you guys can do to prepare now to be a great entrepreneur. So, um, does anyone know how many businesses fail? How many startup businesses fail? Anyone have an idea? It is 90%. 90% of businesses fail, says Forbes. Another Bloomberg says 80. So hope we're going to go with we're going to go with Bloomberg, hopefully. So of all of the people who start businesses, <coughs> nine out of ten or eight out of ten fail. Do you guys have any idea why that is? You got capital problems. What else? What they're selling. Yeah, maybe there's no market for it. That's right. Yeah. They do. A lot of people quit when they get when it gets hard. Cash flow. Cash cash flow is a huge problem. Some grow too fast too soon. It's too fast too soon. That's a really good one. Poor management. Okay. Well, you guys just come up and I will sit down and I will learn from you guys because <laughs> I think all of these things are really important. So um, I have had the opportunity as a ghostwriter. One of the best opportunities I've had is to be able to ghostwrite Forbes and entrepreneur columns um, and learn from these top-notch CEOs. So not only do I have my own experience um, in entrepreneurship, but I also have the experience of these guys who are, are writing their, their columns. And I'm gleaning all of their experience there. So I, I write for one that has, um, oh, you know, I don't know how much the businesses are worth, but hundreds of millions of dollars and tens of millions of dollars. And the principles are all the same. And it's been such a fantastic way for me to learn and then doing it myself. So I have six qualities that I think are really important. <coughs> the first one is a strong work ethic. And I know you guys don't need any education on like strong work ethic. College students are the hardest working people that I know. They're, you guys are not entitled. You work hard. You stay up all night if you have to to get your deadlines done and you guys oftentimes have you know another job on the side right in order to try to make it I also have it on good authority that SUU students are much better than students up north in other Utah schools <laughs> <laughs> you guys are a card I know I actually had somebody um, who shall remain unnamed um, tell me that SUU students are the hardest working students, and he's very well connected with all these universities. He said, SEU students are my favorite because they're not entitled, they work hard, and they're grateful for the opportunity to work. And I just want to let you guys know you're making a, a huge impression among uh, business leaders of today, just by, just by that. So a strong work ethic, to me, when I hire, it's one of the most important things the most important thing because I figure even if you've got about like you know average intellect you can make up for it all the way with how hard you work and if you are wicked smart and you have a hard work ethic strong work ethic there's no stopping you just period there is no stopping you so um, so uh, Ryan Westwood and Travis Johnson wrote a book called the five characteristics of a successful entrepreneur and they surveyed 2,600 CEOs and company founders about the essential characteristics of entrepreneurial success. One of the top five was a strong work ethic. That was one of the very, very best. And so one of the reasons um, our business has been growing so well is because of that strong work ethic. Um, I feel like it's really important. You know, I've had 
my own struggles and trying to like make ends meet with kids and and I'm just grateful for the opportunity to work and that comes through. In fact, um, one of our clients is uh, the CEO of Amada uh, Senior Care, um, Tafa Jefferson. He's this, he's a former NFL player and he's just like this big, big dude that's six foot six and he walks in there and he goes and helps all the little old ladies and, you know, get their, get their care and he, I mean, he's just like so great. And he told me one day, he's like, you know, I love working with you. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> Why do you? And he said, because you think it's just a privilege to work with me. And I do. I think it's a privilege to be able to have that opportunity to work. And he, it comes through, and that's why he likes working with me. So that is a really, that's a really, really good quality to develop. A uh, Harvard study found that the single biggest predictor of adult mental illness was the development of a strong work ethic. So if you want to be successful in business and in life, this is a good one for you. So um, the people who, the men that they surveyed who had developed a work ethic um, were twice as likely to have warm relationships, five times more likely to have well-paying jobs, and 16 times more likely to, less likely to have suffered significant unemployment. That was a Harvard study. So number one, what's the number one quality? Work hard. Work hard. It sounds kind of like, you know, yeah, yeah, work hard and you'll achieve your dreams, but it really is true. All right. The second one is a can-do attitude. A can-do attitude, glass half empty, glass half full. You've heard it all a million times, but it really does translate well. And it's not only looking at things positively, but it's also being a really good problem solver. I think that's one of the very most important um, characteristics that I try to teach my employees is to learn how to solve problems and to figure out how you're gonna do it and say, I can do this and I will do this, so sometimes I'll have, um, I have a, one of my favorite people um, is a web developer and he'll come to me and, you know, sometimes web developers, they're very quick to tell you what cannot be done, right? And not as like a, you know, not everybody, but a lot of, a lot of that type of person, they're very, you know, they know what they know and they know what the parameters are. And so he'll come to me sometimes and be like, uh, this just can't be done. And I'll say, you know what? It can be. And I know it can be because I've seen other people do it. So you just have to figure it out. And he'll be like all frustrated and go back. And <laughs> but he figures it out. And he does a great job. And it's a great, so, it, so just know, whatever you decide to do, it can be done. You just have to figure out a way to do it. So that can-do attitude is really important. So I want to tell you a story about... Um, a guy named David Williams. He's the CEO of Fishbowl. Have you guys ever heard of Fishbowl? They're a huge technology company in Utah. And he is a friend of mine. And, and um, he has been in business for uh, probably 15-ish years with Fishbowl and is just uber successful. And he has this employee, and his name is Kendrick. So Kendrick, he, was, uh, he started out as an engineer and came to David 12 years ago and said, hey, I want a job. And he was like, well, we're a technology company. Do you have any technology experience? And he's like, no, I'm an electrician. And he's like, well, do you want to be an electrician for your whole life? And he said, well, no, I don't want to be an electrician my whole life. He was newly married, 24, ambitious and smart. And so the company was expanding quickly. And so David decided to take a risk on him. So things went well. And he, they put him in the support uh, the training and support area because they needed some more help there. And so he just like dug in there and he learned his stuff and he was really good with clients. And so he quickly became the go-to guy for the support. And so then he said, okay, David, a few years later, he's like, David, okay, I've mastered this. I know what clients need and what they want in the training department. And he said, okay. He said, now I want to go into development. And he was like, well, do you have any development skill? He goes, no, I have none. <laughs> but I still want to be in it because I know what clients want and I know what they need. And I can work with the development team to give it to them. And so David, being an out-of-the-box thinker like he is, said, okay, that's fine. Why don't you go work in the development team? And you can go tell them how they can better make something that clients want. And so Kendrick goes in there and he starts working with the development team. And and first they're pushing back. They're like, dude, you know nothing about development. And he's like, but I know what clients want. 
And so he start, they start collaborating together and they develop mutual respect and, and he turns the development team into this supercharged machine where they're producing better results with four times the productivity. And this guy has no development experience. So then a little while later, he says, you know, David, I think development is really awesome, but now I want to try sales. And David's like, okay. Well, at this point, he's like, sure, do whatever you want, you know, <laughs> because he's just overhauling the organization. And so Kendrick goes in there and he says, okay, I'm going to do sales. And within one month, it usually takes six months to onboard people. And within one month, he was in the top 25% of performers. This guy's amazing. But this is what was really amazing was he, a little while you know, afterwards with that short stint in sales, he came back to David and said, you know, I know I'm making a lot of money here and I'm really successful in what I'm doing, but I think it's going to be better for the organization if I go back to development and run the development team. And David said, well, you know you're going to take a pay cut if you do that. And he said, yeah, I know. I know I'm going to take a big pay cut, but it's worth it to me because I feel like this is what the organization needs and wants. And so David said, of course, go for it. And he has been you know, leading the development team as the VP of development ever since. To me, that is an amazing story of a can-do attitude where somebody who really doesn't have any training or background in something can completely overhaul an organization just by having that amazing attitude. Um, I have an employee. He is, uh, he's not probably, you know, he's not the most careful person. And he is, um, like he has some limitations, like we all do. Um, but I was talking with somebody and I was like, why do you love this guy so much? And I'm like, well, let me tell you why. I will be worried about a project and I'll email him at 11 o'clock at night. And he'll get right back to me and be like, sure, I'd love to help you with that. <laughs> and I'm sure he's grumbling inside going, I can't believe she talked to texting me at 11 o'clock at night. And then whenever I ask him to do something, I ask him to take on a new assignment, sure, I would love to help you do that. And he goes full bore into it. And it doesn't matter to me if he makes mistakes. It doesn't matter to me if it's not perfect because I know that he's going to do a great job and he's going to do it because he's got a can-do attitude. No matter what I ask him, he's like, sure, I will do that and I'll figure out how to do it. So that, to me, that is the second most important quality behind work ethic. The third trait is to be a team player. So we've all heard that it's you know important to be a team player and there is no I in team, right? I mean, you guys have heard all these things before, right? So why is this so important? So I can't emphasize to you how important this actually is. Um, as, a, as a team, as a creative agency, we have a lot of hands touching these projects in order to deliver the type of results that we need. Um, let's say just like a simple flyer, for example. We need to have somebody do the project management on it and talk with the client about what they want and need. We need to have a designer design all of the assets and we need to have two proofreaders on it to make sure that we don't have any typos. We've got a, a pretty strident proofing process to make sure that our quality is top notch. So that's at least four people and then I always approve the stuff at the end. And so we've got five people on it. We have also pretty quick deadlines that we have to turn it around. Like, so a flyer would usually take two to three days. Not full, but just between all of the hands um, that it touches, we need to get it back to the client within about that time. And so there's really no room for, there's really no room for ego. And we hired someone in the summer who um, did have an ego. And she was a very, very talented designer. But she wouldn't tell anybody when she was going to deliver her stuff. So we couldn't keep her for longer than a month. You know, we're just like, you know, we like you, but you're just not a good fit for us because you're not a team player and you've got an ego about your design. And so being a team player is so, so, so important in our business and really in any other business. You also have to be able to say that you've made a mistake. That's part of being a good team player is being able to say, that was my bad. I'm really sorry and be able to say, okay, that's fine. Because sometimes when I want to know who does something wrong, it's not because I'm like gonna go like chastise them or anything. It's because I want to know how to fix the process. I want to know how it happened so I can make sure I can prevent it from happening again. Mistakes are inevitable and any good CEO will know that. 
and will hire good people and trust them that they're going to do their best. And then when mistakes happen, then you fix the process rather than the person, if that makes sense. So being a good team player is really, really, really important. So um, what about like globalization? You know, with all of, with all of our, our global economy, we have people that work on three different continents at our company. So how do we manage those kinds of deadlines? Um, it's actually very easy when you are a team player. And there was a study, um, the Boston Consulting Group did a study of 80 software development teams. And they found that uh, they looked at 28 research facilities in the United States, China, Brazil, Denmark, France, Germany, and other countries. They found that virtual teams with strong task-related processes performed better than local teams. So does it matter if you're in India? Not really. Does it matter if you're in Argentina? No. As long as you are a good team player and you're getting, meeting your deadlines and you're you know, working hard, it doesn't really matter where you live. We, d we actually have that um, uh, flexibility as one of our core values. And so we are able to um, provide good, flexible working environments for people. Like we had one employee who worked really hard, and she wanted to spend a month in Hawaii and work from Hawaii. And we're like, yeah, I guess as long as you get your work done. <laughs> and she did great. So when you are that good of a, an employee and you work that hard, then you will be allowed certain certain allowances and people will want to keep you happy and want to keep you on their team. Okay, trait number four is opportunity seeker. So my story, and I, I apologize for repeating myself because some of you guys have heard this yesterday, but my story, I'm such an unlikely candidate to be a CEO and an entrepreneur. When I was your age, when I was in college, um, my goal was to um, get married as a junior and have a baby as a senior and never look back. That was my goal. I was so excited to be a stay-at-home mom and have a bunch of kids. And, and so then I got through college and I was like, hmm, well, I'm not married, so maybe I'll just go to grad school because that's a great place to find a guy. It's not a great reason to go to grad school. <laughs> Terrible. Anyway, so I stayed. I was at Brigham Young University at the time. And so I stayed there and then I got married and finished my degree. There and then I moved um, to Pennsylvania to help my husband get through medical school. And sadly, we got divorced, and I ended up with two kids in my parents' basement. And I was like, now what? Now what do I do? I'm like, well, I guess I better go back to school because that's what I know. And so I thought it would also be a good um, career move to, for having young kids because the schedule would be a little more flexible. And so I went back to school and I met this great guy online and it was a mutual friend and it was long distance and it ended up working out much to my surprise and it was awesome and so then we moved to California and um, then I had a couple more kids and he got a job with Lehman Brothers which was I, are you guys familiar with Lehman Brothers okay so like this huge investment firm it was like the largest in the country and we got a he got a job with them for um, and, and we were like thrilled we thought oh we're, we're set we're set. It was 2007. Things <laughs> and two months later, Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, and we were so bummed. And Jeff lost his job, and I was like, well, now what? So um, I started working, and as a mom job, I had little babies and tried to like, help support our family a little bit. And Jeff had, you know, Jeff found work elsewhere, but we were really struggling. And so um, we actually had $10,000. Um, as a tax return and we decided to split it and invest it and we had a competition to see who could invest the five thousand dollars the best and he put it in the market and I put it in Osmond marketing and so I won <laughs> yay but anyway it was so you never know you just never know what life is going to throw at you you know and and I could never imagine my life being any other way than it is now I love my life I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be an entrepreneur and to have kids and also be able to work and it's a it's a really it's, it's a perfect life for me but um, had I not been prepared with school like kind of like kind of like you know kind of prepared against my what I wanted to do um, but because I was an opportunity seeker and tried to do my best in whatever 
area that I was in, then it enabled me to be able to take those opportunities when they presented themselves. So being an opportunity seeker is a huge, a huge, huge thing. So have you ever, um, have you ever like had an opportunity where you thought, ah, it's just too good to be true. Like I can't, I'm not going to take this opportunity because like, like I, how could this be happening to me? Have you, has anybody ever had that experience before? Anyone? Okay, so this kind of happened to me when um, I, w it was at the presidential campaign and I wanted to interview Gary Johnson. I thought he was so cool. And I, and I was like, he, but my, like my friends, they were like, well, he's a presidential candidate. Like, he'll talk to you. And I'm like, I'm going to try. And so um, there was a reason that I wanted to get a hold of him. And I can't remember what it was. But so I like sent a Facebook message and nothing happened. And I sent like two and nothing happened. And then I decided to just blast all of his social media all at the same time. So I sent like three messages on Facebook and all of his different Facebook groups. And I sent him an email and I called his campaign manager. And so then he's like, fine. <laughs> And he agreed to meet with me, and we, I did an entrepreneur article on him, and it was fantastic. It was one of the best experiences that I've had. He's a, he was a very articulate, and I wish he would, oh wait, I shouldn't say that, anyway. Um, I'm very happy with what's going on now, but anyway, I really liked him as a, as a uh, person, and so lucky to have that experience. And had I not just taken that opportunity, you know, I would have never, it would have passed me by. And since then, being able to um, interview a notable person like that has helped me, you know, kind of like step onto new um, opportunities. So, that is my, that's my story there. Do, do we have any questions so far? Should I get through the six traits and then do questions? Do yeah. How did you invest your $5,000 in the first place? How did I invest it? Oh, uh, well, I had to buy some Adobe software and I had to um, do some, it was a, a book was our first project. And so I needed to pay for some printing costs and um, what else? Oh, we had to incorporate the business and those kinds of things to get the business up and running. Good question. Um, so the, uh, the fifth trait is to be a good communicator. So I cannot tell you how important this is. This is so important and this, this is the easiest thing to do and also the thing that so many businesses don't do. Um, the businesses that fail are the ones that think that they're too good for their clients and their customers. And that is just like, if you want to kill your business, do that. Don't communicate. Um, we actually had a, um, one client recently, just, I've just been thinking about it because we're finishing up a website for them. <coughs> and he started getting a little bit frustrated and I started digging deep into it and realizing, well, number one, the designer was being the project manager, which for this particular project was fine, but she wasn't used to being a project manager, so she wasn't getting back to him and communicating well enough. So I put her on the task of giving him a daily update every day. And since then, it has been smooth sailing. And not only that, but he wants to send us business. And he wants to partner on videos and marketing. and so. When you have that good communication, and when you're willing to be able to say, I'm really sorry, I don't feel like we've communicated this very well for you, and anticipate what their needs are. He didn't tell me he was frustrated. I just kind of like, I just kind of got the impression. And because I like, you know, kind of like anticipated his needs, and tried to really communicate well with him, it turned out wonderfully. So being a good communicator, I think, is a really, really, really important thing. Uh, the sixth trait is to be skilled at leveraging, and this is really hard to do. Really hard to do. It's hard for me to do. It's hard. This is, this is what holds back 95% of businesses. So I have a friend. His name is David Northington. Um, he is the CEO of Cloud Sherpas that was just basically, just, you know, barely bought, and then now he's the VP of Accenture. Are you guys familiar with Accenture? Okay. So Cloud Sherpas had, they went from 5 million to 525 million in five years. It was unbelievable, their growth. And they did it through closed loop marketing and uh, among other things. And they just, they just grew so, so quickly. So I helped him with um, a lecture that he was giving to some university students. And one of the main points he wanted to emphasize, which I think is very important, is that you have to be able to trust and let go. 
And it's hard to know when to do that because if, if people aren't ready for you to trust them and let go, then your business is you know, going to fail. But if you don't trust and let go, then your business is going to fail. So, um, you know, David owns, um, well, he, he advises on a number of businesses outside of Accenture. And he said that from his experience, looking at all of the businesses that he's associated with and that he's come in contact with, 95% of successful entrepreneurs cannot make that leap. They cannot go from outside of their own scope. They're micromanagers, some of them, and it limits them. So you've got this umbrella of what you're capable of doing, whether it's five million in revenue or one million in revenue or 5,000 in revenue, whatever it is that you've got your scope, right? And 95% of people can't get outside of that. So you have to be able to not only be able to trust people and let go and hire people that are really, really smart, but you also have to have a system in place of how you're going to systematically scale this. And I have to tell you, this is really hard to do. I'm in the process of it right now, and it's going well. But if there is, a, is anything that I need to read up on, I need to read up on everything, but this is one of the main areas that I need help with on learning how to leverage and how to scale your business. So the more you can do that now, the better off you are going to be. So um, those, I think, are the six points that I wanted to cover. Um, just to recap them, a strong work ethic, a can-do attitude, um, being a team player, being an opportunity seeker, and a good communicator, and learning how to leverage your team to scale a business. So uh, thank you so much for you know, being willing to sit here and listen to me talk for 40 minutes. And um, I really appreciate it. And congratulations on being an awesome entrepreneurs in training. And I wish you all the very best. Thank you. So we have about 15 minutes for questions. And so I wondered if you guys had any specific questions. And it can be anything. <coughs> Yes? Was it a marketing strategy to use Osmond rather than Cook? Oh, yeah, for sure. Just for like clickbait, because I figured that people would be searching Donnie and Marie. So, yeah, hopefully. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, Donnie and Marie are my aunt and uncle. My dad is one of the original Os Osmond brothers. Yeah. Well, then, can you see it? Would you like to hear a song? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> I did have a stint as a, in a former life as a solo violinist and a backup singer at the Osmond Family Theater in Branson, Missouri. <laughs> I did. That was a good learning experience in itself. <laughs> yes? She said you recommend that we become good at leveraging and scaling now. Mm -hmm. How would you recommend the students that we can start? I would say it's more of a mindset even than, like, let's take your group project, right? Take your group project and see how it goes. Who are you in the group project? Are you the guy that, that micromanages everybody else? Are you the guy that doesn't do anything? Are you the guy that is a leader and organizes, um, organizes your group, holds people accountable, and then double checks the work? Like, that's a one way that you could start developing trust, um, developing really good insights into people's capabilities, and being able to evaluate them effectively, I think is a really, it, it kind of goes along with that. Yeah. In the initial stages of, of starting up the company, when you first started bringing people on, mm -hmm. um, how did you get them motivated other than just like a paycheck mm. to, to strive to work as hard as you, know, you do for your own company? Well, nobody will work as hard as you. That's, that's, the, that's the first truth of it. And they shouldn't. The, what, what incentive do they have? You know, they want a good quality of life. They want, um, you know, they're willing to work hard and to build something awesome. Um, but I do think that if you get the right people, there are builders in, in the world. You know, there are people who are builders and think it's fun to build something and create something from the ground up. So I, I would get those people first. Um, beyond that, you know, we offered some things that other people didn't. So we were able to, because we, you know, prize flexibility, we were able to get some people who really needed a paycheck, um, and they needed flexibility also, but they still had that really awesome 
capability. So when you first start a business, there are, there are CEOs that will tell you that as you grow, you're going to have to recycle your employees because as you become more expert in your craft, um, they're not going to be able to meet that new level. I have not found that to be true. I don't, I don't think that's necessarily true. Um, but I do think that there's something when you first start, you have to give up something. You obviously can't get the VP of Accenture to want to come and be your employee, right? So you have to give up something. So for me, I wasn't willing to sacrifice quality. So the thing that I gave up was a nine to five schedule. I, I chose people, I was able to compensate them well and I chose people who needed the flexibility so we could keep the quality high. Yeah. Sounds like Osman marketing is not a traditional marketing firm. So you, you mentioned books and ghostwriting mm -hmm. and websites. Tell us what we do. What you do. OK, sure. So we specialize in content marketing. So there are those who specialize in digital marketing. We do those services, but our real specialty is content. Um, I'm a writer, and others, um, uh, we hire good writers. And, and that's kind of where we are finding our mark. And um, one thing that we are doing that is kind of showcasing this is we're working in partnership with other digital agencies around that maybe have a, you know expertise on the digital and graphic side, but don't have expertise on the content side. And as you know, SEO relies heavily on content, and so that's where one area that we excel. So I'd say we kind of put our stake in the ground on that one. Yeah. Um, two things first. You're the first one that's been through here that's talked really about being a good communicator, and I appreciate that because Thank you. it's you talked about six being difficult, five is not. Mm -hmm. Being a good communicator is not difficult. Like you said, all you do mm -hmm. is have that person check in with them with mm -hmm. something they were already doing. And so coming from a bigger town to a smaller town, it, it's amazing how easy that can be as simply just calling somebody back. And so I really appreciate mm -hmm. you saying that because it Thank can you. have a huge impact on your business. It does. Um, any business, really. It does. And then I, I like what you talked about with the, uh, being skilled at leveraging something that I stole a long time ago from a successful farmer's insurance agent out of California. He wrote in a book that he has that uh, he's like a professional, uh, he's like a scout for a professional sporting team. Mm -hmm. He's always on the lookout for talent. Mm -hmm. Even though he's not hiring or he's not ready to put somebody in that position, he knows. Mm -hmm where he wants to be, and so he's just always looking, and so he poaches people from all over the place who are already successful and have proven to him through serving him at Pizza Hut mm -hmm. or wherever it may be, mm -hmm. that they have what it takes to feel that quality that he has, and I really like that as far, mm -hmm. as, uh, as, far as building your team and being ready to leverage and let go. Mm -hmm. You need to let go to the right person. And, right. And, that doesn't mean that when you're ready for it, then go find them. You could be looking for the person even before you're ready. Yeah, and, uh, definitely. And I really like how you said that it's, I've had some success using that strategy down uh, in the past as well. So. Cool. Awesome. Thank you for thank you for those thoughts. In fact, just, um, speaking of which, we are looking for a kick butt um, technical writer who knows something about Amazon Web Services as well as a full time graphic and web designer. So, if anyone knows anyone, let me know. Yes. How many employees do you have? Um, we have about 10 full-time and about 15 who range between 5 hours and 35 hours. Yeah. I have a question about your clients. So um, are your clients contracted for um, a certain amount of time? Um, is, it a, is it a contract or is it per case? Well, it really depends on the client. So one of the things, because flexibility is our core value, I keep saying this, um, we try to be really flexible with clients as well. So we typically do contracts with a 30-day out clause. So if they're not happy for any reason, then they can just end. Um, I, I just don't think it serves anybody very well when you have like a year contract and then people, you know, you're in fe into February and nobody likes anybody. You know, it's better to just <laughs> cut your losses, I think. Yeah, good question. Any other questions? I've answered the, everything you want to know about entrepreneurship. <laughs> uh, I got my master's in English and my PhD in communication.
graduate? Um, bachelor, yeah, bachelor's and master's in, in English, yeah. Okay, so um, I just feel like maybe the marketing, um, there's a, it's kind of a saturated field sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just wondering, what, is there anything you did to maybe break through that, like, you know, get the upper hand for you? It's a really good question. I think that providing really top-notch quality is what separates you. And I also think that coming in with a, I think there was, is a gap in the marketplace with really good writers who also know digital uh, marketing really well. I think that is a huge opportunity for writers and communication people and newspaper people. I mean, they're laying off tons, millions, tons of newspaper people. That's a really good opportunity for, um, for people who are skilled writers. Good question. Yeah. Do you have any suggestions on how to balance like being heavily involved in entrepreneurial opportunities as well as family life? Um, well, I think you really just have to be flexible. You have to realize that you're not going to do everything perfectly. You're going to do the best you can. Um, for me, I like to, I have two jobs. I have my entrepreneurship job and I have my taxi driver job in the middle of the afternoon. <laughs> and so I, at about 3 o'clock, I put on my taxi driver hat and I go take all my kids to all their stuff and then I get back to work around 9. And so I've had to give up some things. You know, I don't really go out with friends as much as I used to. Um, I do still occasionally, and I really value the friendships that I have. But, um, you know, I recognize that doing this, by doing this, you have to give up other things. You know, the books that I read are not the, not really the ones that I want to read. I've been wanting to read um, Girl with a Dragon Tattoo for like 10 years. And <laughs> one day I will. But in, it, right now I'm read, reading a book called Be the Business about how CIOs can transform their technology companies. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> but it's really important for me to know this as a business leader. So, yeah. Does that help at all? Was a CIO. <laughs> <laughs> no, it actually is act super interesting. I'm kind of joking. Yes? Um, sure, that's a great, great question. And from my perspective, um, I think sales gets a bad rap because there are too many people who think that they can go out and deliver cookies and like look hot. And this is for women, or and men, I and men too. But like, and uh, and like, just win people over with their personality and charm and. And that's just not really the case. People are too savvy and they're too busy and they need to know how you can help them solve a problem. So if you are able to answer their business questions um, and help them, show them the business case of your service, then there's really not too much sales involved. It's really all about educating people. And so I think that the level of customer savvy has risen quite dramatically, especially from, you know, since the digital revolution where everybody can search everything. So you're entering the buyer's journey um, at a different stage than you used to, you know, most of the time. You know, it used to be where you come in and you just like start, you know, getting people interested in your product and you go through like all the different stages and, and you get a sale. Well, now you're entering when people, you know, probably have a pretty good idea of what you do. And so now your job is to just teach them what they need to know, help them solve their business problems, basically be like an unpaid consultant for them in a way, and you know help them, show them how you can solve their business problems. So for me, um, I don't believe in paid consulting. I do, but I do believe in it if that's your job. But for me, um, where I you know do marketing services, I don't charge people for my consulting work. I just help them figure out what their business case is and then provide the services for them. I think it's more valuable that way. So when you landed some of your clients, can you tell us the story and maybe how that would happen? Oh, well. <laughs> how about your first client? My Did first client? Work? Okay, sure. My first client was Hey, Dad, don't you need some merchandise for your... <laughs> don't you need some merchandise? You've been in the entertainment business for 50 years and you don't even have a book. Yeah, I'd really like to do a joke book. A joke book would be awesome. I'm like, okay, let's do a joke book. And then let's write some of your stories. So that's, that was my first client. And that was in 2009. 
<laughs> Maybe your second. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, so here's an interesting client. And um, one client that we did a book for, his name was uh, Jimmy Adams, and he was running a hedge fund. And um, in the crash, he got he lost his job and he couldn't even find a job at McDonald's. And so he ended up working as a night shift waiter for a Waffle House. And he learned all of these amazing financial lessons from an ex-convict who is a master grill operator at Waffle House. And he thought that was so ironic that he would learn his best financial lessons there when he had been on Wall Street for so many years that he wrote a book about it. And we published the book and we got it into the hands of some film people. And they recently released it. It's a feature film starring Danny Glover and James Lafferty. So that was a fun success story. So that was that's pretty exciting. Um, I'm trying to think of how, how we've been getting some of our other clients. Usually now it's a referral where it's somebody that we've worked with in the past. Other questions? Yeah. Um, you don't necessarily have the, the business background as far as an education. Uh -huh. um, and so going into business, I'm sure you had to figure things out, mm -hmm. get brick walls, and have hurdles to jump. Mm -hmm. Do you maybe just share um, some of those challenges that you didn't anticipate when you invested $5,000, you know? Uh-huh. Uh, sure. Um, OK, so you know my husband's a finance major, right? Or a fi finance guy. He was a finance major, and then he became very successful in finance. So when I first started the business, I put all of our earnings on a spreadsheet. And he wasn't super interested in my business, I have to admit, at first. And um, he was very, you know, he was busy doing his own job and, and still is. And I came to him and I was like, okay, I got my spreadsheet. And he, I will never forget it. He took one look and he walked out of the room and he came back 10 minutes later and he goes, I am now your CFO. <laughs> and so he was very helpful in getting all of our documents organized. And since then, we've expanded quite a bit. And, you know, we were very, you know, I'm much more business savvy than I used to be. But that is, I tell you that story just to let you know, like, we all have gaps. And one of the main things that is important in entrepreneurship is to recognize where your gaps are and to find people to help fill them because we all have them. And so being, you know, I, with all of these CEOs that I um, interview, one common theme that they all say, and I found to be true as well, is that um, you, one of the best things you can do as an entrepreneur is have the humility to hire people who are better than you are and fill those gaps where you, especially where you lack. Okay, one more question. Any final questions? I have one. Sure. Your biggest mistake in your business. Ooh. My biggest mistake in my business was also a really, really, really good learning experience. And that was when I first started out, I wanted to do books because I my background was um, I was an academic editor. That was my first full time job. And so um, I wanted to do, I wanted to become a publishing house that would do like a traditional royalty model. That was what I knew. And it was a, it was a terrible time to do that. I mean, with the digital revolution, we've got 3 million books being published a year and nobody's reading. Uh, the average book sells 50 copies or less. And so, you know, that was not a very lucrative endeavor, but as I was trying to um, sell these books, and, you know, just like feeling like I was just like spinning my wheels, I learned how to market. I learned how to market something really hard to market. And so I, over time, I realized that, you know, I was actually doing a lot more um, on the marketing side than I was even on the book side. And so we pivoted our company and Osmond Marketing became chiefly a creative agency specializing in content rather than a publishing house that did the traditional royalty model, and ever since then it's been smooth sailing. Okay, we'd like to give you our oh, Thunderbird. Thank this you. is our Regina guest lecture. Oh, I love this. Series. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it.